From Creation Ministries International, you're listening to Creation.com's article podcast. The research and insights that give God the glory, refutes evolution, and gives you the answers to defend your faith. I'm Joseph Darnell. In this podcast, we're going to present the belief in ape men and ape women prior to Charles Darwin. Beliefs regarding various mythological creatures with human-like physical form were present in antiquity, but persisted even into the 18th century and displayed in drawings of various quality. Lack of knowledge was filled in with speculation from mythology and influenced early science. For instance, poor quality drawings of Egyptian baboons became corrupted and modified in 17th and 18th century images, with their subsequent depiction as loose living forest dwelling people, sometimes known as satyrs, orangutans, or homo sylvestris. Such speculation was even present in the work of Carl Linnaeus, and graphically illustrated by one of his students. With some controversy, Linnaeus placed apes and monkeys in the genus Homo, and he tried to identify several missing links as part of an Aristotelian chain of being between apes and human beings. Linnaeus still believed in special creation, but others in the 18th century, such as Lord Monbado, in contrast to Linnaeus argued for an evolutionary progression from ape to man. However, the evolution of man was rejected by Comte de Buffon and Peter Camper on the basis of direct studies of apes and belief in the divine uniqueness of human beings. Orangutan or Homo Sylvestris, Ape Men Before Darwin, written by Andrew Sibley. The belief that human beings evolved from apes developed among some European academics in the late 18th century, and not originally with Darwin in the 19th century. But careless thinking about the subject in the 18th century prepared the ground for Darwin's theory. Historical testimony suggests that popular mythology from antiquity and its influence upon scientific discourse had already primed Europeans' minds to accept the idea of evolution of man from apes. So we're examining the rise of belief in ape men and women at a time when such popular mythology and speculation filled in many gaps left by a lack of knowledge. Poor drawings of the few available specimens were also copied and embellished over several centuries, thus compounding the problem. Firstly, beliefs relating to strange creatures from antiquity will be outlined via Pliny's Natural History and Augustine's City of God. Then consideration will be given to developments in the early modern period, followed by the flaw classification scheme set out by Linnaeus and erroneously portrayed in drawings by his student Hoppius in the 18th century. This was, perhaps unwittingly, one of the first ever ape-to-man comparative drawings, but without belief in an evolutionary progression. The scheme was based upon the Aristotelian great chain of being, albeit still in the context of special creation. Lord Monbado, on the other hand, argued for an evolutionary progression from ape to man, but this idea was rejected by Comte de Buffon and Peter Camper on the basis of empirical studies human intelligence, and lack of capability for complex language. Accounts for strange human-like creatures or human beings with severe physical deformities are found in works from antiquity. Pliny, a first-century Roman author, relayed accounts from the then-known world in his writing Natural History. The Cyopodus, or Monocoli, as they were called, pardon me on the pronunciation, were considered to possess one leg, but with large feet with which to shade from the sun, while the pygmies were a race of dwarf humans often engaged in struggle with cranes. These satyrs from the mountains of western India were said to sometimes run on two legs, sometimes on four, but were very swift. They were also referred to as forest people or wild people. In Latin, gentem silvestrem, covered in hair with striking eyes and dog-like teeth, unable to speak but only screech. It is likely that Pliny was relaying eyewitness sightings of apes, but the satyrs of ancient Greece were godlike creatures, half human and half animal with the legs or ears of goats or horses. In the early Christian period, Augustine set a clear demarcation between Adam's lineage, mythical creatures, and non-human animals. His discussion included the pygmies, hermaphroditus, among other so-called creatures and known animals of apes and monkeys and he was skeptical of some of the incredible reports, wondering whether they were in fact accurate. He commented, 
But whoever is anywhere born to man, that is, a rational, mortal animal, no matter what unusual appearance he presents in color, movement, sound, nor how peculiar he is in some power, part, or quality of his nature, no Christian can doubt he springs from the one protoplast, Adam. Augustine commented further that if one did not already know that apes and monkeys and sphingas are not human but animals, then some historians would possibly describe them as races of men and flaunt with impunity their false and vainglorious discoveries. Augustine correctly identified the pygmies as a tribe of humans and their small stature did not take away from their genetic connection to Adam. In subsequent centuries, belief in the existence of satyrs and homo silvestris persisted in Latin Silvestris of the forest. The testimony of foreign traders and seamen also relayed fabulous stories from indigenous people living in distant lands, and these accounts subsequently passed into the academic imagination. While in Asia, beliefs about godlike men and women arose, sometimes with ape-like features. They were referred to as Vanara in India, Vana for forest, and Nara for man and usually depicted as human but with the heads of monkeys. They were believed to have some supernatural powers, and so became entwined with the Hindu pantheon. And the Chinese believed in a godlike monkey king, Sung Wukong, said to be born from a stone and possessing great strength and magical powers. Further east, the Indonesians held that there were ape-human hybrids that lived in the jungle. The name given was Orangutang, meaning man of the woods. Orang means person, now Tang means forest, but in reality, they were probably a reference to the orangutan animal. Few specimens of apes from Africa and Asia arrived in Europe during the early modern period, allowing confused speculation as to the nature of these animals to grow. Some knowledge of apes and monkeys was known from antiquity in Europe from their connections to India, Egypt, and North Africa. But much of this knowledge was understood through hearsay, influenced by speculation from mythology and sometimes imaginative illustrations. In the 16th century, one of the best illustrated works on zoology was Conrad Gessner's Historia Animalium, first published in 1551. This book depicted many exotic animals with remarkable accuracy, including monkeys and apes. Mixed in with these was an illustration of a large monkey called Cercopithecus that was a virtual copy of Bredenbach's image in 1488, a long-tailed monkey standing with the stature and form of a man with human-like arms and legs, holding a staff and leading a camel. Gessner referred to this drawing as a hairy satyr with human-like form. The words underneath Bredenbach's drawing implied there was no agreement about the name of the animal. Bredenbach's image was possibly derived from an ancient Egyptian iconography of the god Thoth, sometimes portrayed as a baboon with a staff. It may also be a rather poor illustration of another baboon. Gessner also used the testimony of ancient Greek scholars such as Megasthenes, who referenced observations of monkeys in India, and like Bredenbach, illustrated his drawing with the face of an ape. In the early 17th and 18th centuries, apes and monkeys from various continents were collectively known as orangutan, with much speculation as to their origins. Dutch anatomist Nicholas Tolp had the opportunity to examine either a chimpanzee or a bonobo that had been brought back in a trading ship, most likely from Angola, but with doubt as to its origin. This was a gift for the pleasure of the Prince of Orange, Friedrich Henry. Tolp referred to this animal as an orangutan, from the Malay language, or Homo Silvestris. He gave the specimen the name Ceterus Indicus, thus adding some confusion regarding its true nature, but evidently with influence from Pliny's description. The image appeared in a publication, a, a book of monsters as it was called, because of its graphical depiction of various physical disorders, published in 1652. Another book of monsters was published in 1642 entitled Monstrorum Historia, it depicted as male and female, a dark-colored human being covered in hair, which was described as homonym Silvestrium, that is, wild man of the forest. The book placed the satyrs in the same group, and depicted various forms including goat-footed and feline forms. Jacobus Bontius from his travels to Java also graphically illustrated an orangutan, or woodman, Homo Silvestris, with the characteristics of a hairy human female, remarkably similar to that of the Book of Monsters. 
This work was written in 1631, but first published in 1658, after Bontius' death, and after Tulp's account of the chimpanzee. Similar terminology was used for very different creatures by Bontius and Tulp. Bontius claimed to have seen firsthand both sexes walking on two feet, and that the females showed some human emotions and modesty. These beings he likened to the satyrs of Pliny, believing further that they were actually human-ape hybrids. He relayed indigenous claims that they could talk, but merely did not want to out of fear of forced labor, although he likely copied such claims from Richard Jobson's The Golden Trade, from 1623. Bontius' sightings, if real, were most probably of the orangutans, but he appears to have borrowed from other authors. More significantly, Jensen noted that Bontius' drawing, evidently adapted from the images of the monster book, Genser and Breidenbach, had an extraordinary career as an illustration in zoological literature across Europe over a period of two centuries. In England in 1698, Edward Tyson, an anatomist and member of the Royal Society, had an opportunity to dissect an imported chimpanzee, referring to it as a pygmy. He compared his dissection with human anatomy and existing knowledge gained from studies of apes, albeit not especially accurate ones. He concluded that his specimen was probably the closest possible link between ape and man. He thought it was able to walk upright, had speech organs similar to humans, and a sizable brain, but at the same time it was still an animal because there was no evidence that it was capable of speech. He said, That though our pygmy has many advantages above the rest of its species, yet I still think it is but a sort of ape and a mere brute. And as the proverb has it, an ape is an ape, though finely clad. His colleague, William Cowper, graphically portrayed it with some human-like appearance standing with a stick. But the overall view of Tyson was that the orangutans and pygmies were animals, not human, despite drawing comparisons between the two. In fact, he wrote that all claims of strange creatures from ancient Greece were probably sightings of apes or monkeys, and that conclusion should be the end of the matter for science. I shall accordingly endeavor to make it appear that not only the pygmies of the ancients, but also the Cynocephali and satyrs and sphinges were only apes or monkeys, not men, as they have been represented. Unfortunately, by calling his specimen a pygmy, he blurred the distinction between apes and humans. The pygmy seems to have been understood from antiquity as a tribe of dwarf humans, and the accuracy of his work was called into question by Peter Camper. The later drawing of the mandrill by William Smith in his book A New Voyage of Guinea, 1744, also helped to keep alive belief in human-like creatures that lived in the forest through the 18th century. The connection between apes and human beings was strengthened by Linnaeus developing classification from 1735 to 1758. He considered his endeavor as a believer in special creation was to function as a second Adam in naming animals and plants, and placing them within an intelligently designed plan. His plan, however, was influenced by the Aristotelian great chain of being in which there could be no missing links. It was a hierarchical system and not evidence of any evolutionary progression, but he believed there were designed missing links between apes and human beings, links he intended to identify. Controversially, in his 1758 classification, the genus Homo was placed within the primate order, which were Homo diurnus and Homo nocturnus, Homo troglodytes. The latter included the orangutan, as described by Bontius, and other apes and chimpanzees. The orangutan, or Homo sylvestris, was said by Linnaeus to only come out at night, was covered in white hair and possessed a cat-like third eyelid. He repeated the other's claims that it could even speak, but only with a hissing tone. Homo diurnus was subdivided into Homo sapiens, Homo monstrosus, and Homo furus, thus including separate references to feral children and severely disabled human beings. But the more controversial aspect of this plan was placing monkeys and apes within the genus Homo, thus seemingly removing the distinction between animals and man, with loss of uniqueness of man as the divine image bearer. In his thinking, the divine image in man was an invisible spiritual quality, while his classification schemes stressed anatomical similarities between apes and man without reference to sacred texts. 
At this time, exaggerated popular references to imaginary beasts were still informing science, and the uniqueness of human beings was being undermined by naturalistic commitments in science. John Locke had considered that attempts at classifying human beings were often arbitrary and based upon inadequate subjective criteria, although he recognized the uniqueness of human language and the distinctiveness of complex reasoning. But the separation of mankind from other animals using only natural means became very problematic within the context of naturalism, especially when physical or mental defects that may limit stature or rational ability were considered. Linnaeus' scheme was illustrated further in 1760 by four images presented under the title Anthropomorpha by Linnaeus' student Christian Emmanuel Hoppius as part of his academic dissertation. The term Anthropomorpha was, incidentally, first coined in 1693 by John Ray to denote nail-bearing or anthropoid animals, although humans were excluded by Ray because of his belief in the sacredness of humanity. Hoppius' dissertation was overseen and published by Linnaeus, which suggests it reflected Linnaeus' view regarding these entities, as Thomas Huxley later suggested. From left to right of the illustrations, they became gradually more ape-like, with increasing crouch, an increasingly ape-like head, and more ape-like hands and feet. They were named Troglodyta, Lucifer, Satyrus, and Pygmaeus. While the Hoppius drawings were not considered to be an evolutionary progression by Linnaeus, the images seem to have been falsely and imaginatively modified from earlier drawings to fit into his scheme. The first image on the left in this series of illustrations was called Troglodyta. This image was modified from Bontius' imaginary impression of the orangutan, a forest-dwelling creature that he considered to be an ape-human crossbreed. Hoppius modified Bontius' impression to give it shorter hair. Brown suggests Bontius' image was influenced by Gessner's drawing of 1551 in Historiae and Emilium, and Breidenbach's sketch of 1486 in Pilgrimage to the Holy Land, although there were some commonality with the Monster Books illustration work. Linnaeus considered that this creature was a species of Homo nocturnus. The second image on the left in his series was entitled Lucifer, primarily influenced by Gessner and Breidenbach's drawings. The earlier drawing of Breidenbach was most probably that of a baboon. Brown suggests that Breidenbach's image is possibly derived from ancient Egyptian iconography of Thoth, often portrayed as a baboon with a staff. Hoppius referred to it as a cat-tailed person, and other examples of illustration do contain feline features, as also did one of the satyrs in Mostrorum Historia. Linnaeus considered it to be Homo caudatus, a tailed third species of man. The clearly ape-like face and feet of the earlier drawings have been modified by Hoppius into a more human-like impression, and was used to fit Linnaeus' scheme. So, Breidenbach's baboon became almost human. The third image from the left in these illustrations is the satyr, and it is adapted from an engraving by Gerald John Baptiste Scotson II, pardon my pronunciation, clearly marked as a chimpanzee in 1738. The graphic impression drawn by Hoppius depicts more human-like features, but without the teacup. Linnaeus considered it might be the species Satyrus Silvestris. And then the fourth image on the right, in this series of four, is Pygmaeus, which is a copy of George Edwards' Man of the Woods. This is a drawing of an animal that Tyson had described, which he noted was one of the chimpanzee from Africa. Edwards thought he could offer a more accurate drawing, but also relayed reports of satyrs or orangutans from Asia, which he speculated might be more human-like than his chimpanzee. Buffon challenged Linnaeus' views on the basis of his own study of apes, possessing a live specimen from Africa, called Jocko, or Njocko, from the Congo, but he relied upon the reports of travelers from the large orangutan from Asia. This animal is called Pongo. His Jocko did not speak, not even in a hissing tone, and displayed no more intelligence than a well-trained dog, despite having some superficial similarity to humans. Because Linnaeus also relied on reports from Bontius and Joppa, Buffon doubted the sightings of the large orangutan had been made accurately, that the creature with its white skin and hair was an African albino. Buffon's study was apparently set against an evolutionary connection between humankind and the apes, and he appeared to have maintained a distance between humanity and the rest of the animal realm. 
He considered the capacity for human reason and complex language to be a spiritual endowment from God, and this could not be acquired naturally. He was also open to an acceptance of some evolutionary change among certain living organisms under extended periods of time, but such differences he thought were possibly due to degeneration from the original perfect forms. For instance, he considered that the donkey may have been a degeneration of the horse. However, Darwin found Buffon difficult to understand and thought his views often fluctuated greatly during his lifetime. Buffon was of course concerned to protect his reputation and position in Paris, and was perhaps guarded in expressing his actual beliefs in relation to evolution. Other writers in France in the early and mid-18th century were expounding the possibility of some forms of evolution. In the late 18th century, Lord Bombado was more determined to identify an evolutionary link between humans and apes. He practiced as a judge in Scotland, and was otherwise known as James Burnett, 1714 through 1799. Monbado was influenced by the Greek philosophers, and he argued that the Aristotelian great chain of being should extend from apes to man via a gradual process of evolution. He continued to accept the accounts of travelers regarding the orangutan, and with credulity the existence of the strange Plinian beings from the ancient world. He was mocked for suggesting men once had tails, his arguments were put forward in two volumes, of the origin and progress of language in 1773 through 1792, and ancient metaphysics, 1779 through 1799. Therefore, he rejected the evidence-based opinion of Tyson and Buffon that apes and human beings were clearly different and separately created entities. Monbado maintained, without evidence, that apes and monkeys possessed a rudimentary language thus reinforcing the link to mankind and worked doggedly in support of his position. He also speculated that early man had lived peaceably close to nature and had a primitive language. To support his view, he proposed a number of experiments and studied several accounts of feral children. Monbado's acquaintance, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, had earlier argued for the social evolution of mankind from a state of nature, with early man living in blissful ignorance like the apes. However, Rousseau was less willing to argue for the biological evolution of mankind, believing that early man had the present physical form even though only possessing animal-like mental capacities. Monbado also rejected anatomical studies by Peter Camper that found no evidence of speech organs on the orangutan. This is on the basis that Camper's animals came from Borneo and not from the place of Tyson's specimen, probably Angola. Camper's conclusions were significant in view of the fact that he had dissected a good number of animals in his work. Camper commented, Having dissected the whole organ of voice in the orang, in apes, and several monkeys, I have a right to conclude that orang and apes are not made to modulate the voice like men. For the air passing by the rima glottitus is immediately lost in the ventricles or ventricle of the neck, as in apes and monkeys must consequently return from thence without any force and melody within the throat and mouth of these creatures. And this seems to be the most evident proof of the incapacity of orangs, apes, and monkeys to utter any modulated voice, as indeed they have never been observed to do. Kemper was also critical of earlier anatomical studies by Tyson, concluding he had overlooked the significance of the detail of the voice organs. It is evident that beliefs stemming from antiquity regarding the existence of mythical creatures continued into the early modern period, despite clear statements of caution from Augustine. Popular superstition and mythology filtered into the minds of many academics when faced with new but limited numbers of primate specimens from Africa and Asia. These were depicted through sometimes poor drawings, which reinforced error through several centuries. Tyson's analysis from the late 17th century showed that there was a clear distinction between apes and human beings, and he argued persuasively that many of the claims from ancient times were most probably sightings of apes and monkeys. Such rational thinking should have clarified matters for science, although Tyson's work left an opportunity for confusion and was later criticized by Camper. Further confusion arose through Linnaeus's classification scheme, which placed human beings within the primate order, alongside apes and monkeys which were classified within the subgenus Homo nocturnus. This classification was reinforced by the embellished drawings of Hoppius, 
arguably one of the first imaginative ape to man march of progress drawings. Although Linnaeus believed in special creation, it was a few years later that Lord Monbado argued for an evolutionary connection between the apes and human beings. It is noteworthy that speculation from travelers and popular mythology from antiquity was still informing scientific discourse into the 18th century, and this arguably laid some of the groundwork for later acceptance of Darwinian evolution. But the best evidence-based scientific studies from Buffon and Camper showed a clear demarcation between human beings and the other animals. Buffon recognized the important distinctions of intelligence and language, and commented that apes showed no more intelligence than a well-trained dog, although Buffon was sometimes ambiguous in his beliefs. Camper clarified from anatomical studies that apes and monkeys were incapable of speech. When Darwin and Huxley resurrected the evolutionary link in the 19th century, it was on the basis of comparative brain physiology. Belief in evolution also fed upon an undercurrent of popular mythology that there existed missing links between apes and men, but the search for the missing links soon passed from the present to the fossil record. You already know that our culture is struggling immensely with the issue of racism. Here at Creation Ministries International, we always take a Bible-first approach to scientific, historical, and cultural issues. We know the Bible holds the key to every problem, and Jesus Christ can pay the debt owed for every sinner regardless of skin shade or social status. Do you want to bring truth and grace to the people around you who are struggling with the issue of racism? If so, we have a tool that will help you in your efforts. One Human Family is a moving presentation by one of the leaders of the modern creation movement, Dr. Carl Wieland. It explains how the Bible's big picture of our origins shows we must all be closely related, literally one human family. This presentation is based upon Dr. Wieland's major book that is currently out of print but still available in ebook formats. Throughout history, competing stories about human origins have sought to undermine or distort this one human family concept to justify racism, a sin not unique to just whites. So racism existed before Charles Darwin, but his origin story was by far the most successful in undermining the biblical one human family. This flung open the door to a flood of eugenics and racism, culminating in the Holocaust. Modern discoveries of our astonishingly close relatedness were not a prediction from theories of human evolution, but they are a prediction from the Bible. The lesson? When popular culture or scientific views are out of sync with the Bible, resist the temptation to give in, because as here, it means the science is either being misinterpreted or needs to catch up. The One Human Family DVD is now available at creation.com store, and a link to it is available in the show notes. From all of us at creation.com, thanks for listening.